So, first of all, welcome. Um, it's a great pleasure for us all to be here and to share this opportunity with you to talk about the aspect of streaming context and convergence, and especially as it relates to classical music. And uh, we look forward to sharing some of the outstanding views of some of the leading cultural institutions in the world, some of the greatest heritage brands of classical music, and clearly having their expertise and the opportunity for them to share their strategies of their organizations with us has really has a, has a benchmark of what possibilities can be achieved for streaming, both in terms of revenue production, but also in terms of reaching out to audiences, audience engagement, and really a customer relationship management. And hopefully also to then share some perspectives with you also on what could be done also with other kinds of organizations or individuals that may not be as globally renowned as either the Berlin Philharmonic or the Metropolitan Opera of New York. Our session is scheduled to last 45 minutes and we've planned to have about 30 minutes of panel discussion, giving them an opportunity to share their practices with you and, and their views on the current state of streaming in the classical music industry. And then we'd like to open up the last 15 minutes to your questions. So during the presentation, if you have any comments or questions, please note them down and be ready to bring them up at the end. Before I ask the members to introduce themselves, I'd actually like to share a few media reports that have come out in the last few days about streaming, the greater context of streaming. I think as we all recognize, classical music is, is really, in terms of the overall economy of the music industry, um, a niche market, but nonetheless, it's interesting to look at the larger context in which the world of streaming is going. In fact, yesterday, the Financial Times had an interesting lead article about Spotify, which has just announced that they're now introducing video into their streaming content. And there's a great deal of speculation that they've rushed this through because there is clearly a great deal of talk that Apple is also getting ready to unveil their streaming service. As many of you know, Apple made its largest acquisition in its history of three billion US dollars for Beats, not only because of being a headphone manufacturer, but largely to get the expertise of the Jimmy Yavine and Dr. Dre for their streaming capabilities. Um, and clearly Apple is in a much, much different position, has one of the world's greatest device makers, um, devices which we consume music and listen to music, and uh, are now able to also access video. And clearly, the fact that they can make this part of an integrated element of their ecosystem and of their iOS operating system puts them in an interesting position in terms of being able to interact with the customer and track how people are actually consuming music. Um, clearly, that streaming is now becoming mainstream, to use a pun, uh, I think is really underlined by the recent report that the Warner Music Group in their last quarter announced that they derived more money from streaming than from digital downloads. And uh, although digital downloads are still increasing, I think for the Warner Music Group they indicated in the last quarter it increased by 11%, that's slower than the 33% increase that they're seeing in streaming revenue. Clearly, within the value chain, and again, whether we're an individual, an, a, a young artist, an emerging artist, a regional orchestra, a local artist manager. So regardless of, of our position in the overall ecosystem, to use the word again, of the classical music industry, we're concerned about streaming both as a promotional tool, as engaging with our customers, getting to know our customers, getting to know how they consume our music, how they relate to our music, um, how we can improve our services for them, but ultimately also, also has a revenue model. And so clearly there's a great deal of concern in the industry about where is the money going. Um, there's also concern to be aware that what now remain as the three major record labels actually have 20% ownership in Spotify. Clearly Spotify is the leading streaming platform, is controversial. Um, they have a great deal of membership. In fact, the overwhelming majority of Spotify users are using their free model, which is an advertising-based model. But nonetheless, there's a lot of revenue there. And uh, recently, it was just announced on May 19th, there came to light a 2011 contract 
between Sony Music and Spotify that paid 42.5 million US dollars in advances to Spotify. And clearly, we know from even leading pop artists like Taylor Swift, the controversies about the small amount of money that's trickling, trickling down through streaming services to artists. And uh, now, I think with this announcement that this huge advance came up, and uh, where has this gone, where has it stayed, is probably going to generate in the next few days and few weeks further controversy about this issue. Clearly, streaming now also has a source of revenue for artists and art organizations um, is, a, is a challenging issue. And Spotify, with their free subscriber service, is not the only model. In fact, globally, one of the, the very successful business models that have been employed is that of Netflix, which I'm sure you all know. And if, it's an interesting line chart comparing Spotify to Netflix. And as you can see, the horizontal axis represents the time period from 2011 up to the first quarter of this year. And we have millions of users on the vertical axis. And you see a huge contrast where has Netflix's overall subscribers are almost all completely paying subscribers. Those of Spotify, who stand roughly at 60 million subscribers, of those, only 15 million are actually paying. So now if Apple does indeed enter the fray and has leading classical institutions around the world are also developing their streaming strategies, where is this going to go? Is it going to continue to be a promotional model? Is it going to try and generate revenue through advertising support? Or is it also going to be able to have paid for services? And hopefully this provides a, a general context for our discussions now in the realm of classical music. And to begin with, I'd actually like to ask Elena to introduce herself and her organization. Hi, everyone. So just a quick, super quick um, snapshot of the Met Opera and its activity in the area of streaming, broadly speaking. Um, the Metropolitan Opera was founded in 1883, and we do about 220 performances a year. Um, our theater seats nearly 4,000 people, including standing room, um, and a third of our tickets are under $100. And um, we jumped into more media activity in a big way in the fall of 2006, with, which coincided with um, Peter Gelb's coming on and taking the role of general manager at the Met. Um, and he built some activity on the back of the radio broadcasts, which are now in their 85th year, starting this fall, and we're in 40 countries around the world. And because there was a built-in habit of radio listening on Saturdays, that's how we ended up um, having the HD series, which launched in December 2006. Um, since its launch, we're now in 2,000 theaters in 70 countries around the world. Um, most of them live, um, because in Europe and in the Netherlands and other places, it's kind of prime time Saturday night, um, and only in a few countries, because of the time difference, is it um, done on a delayed basis. So we subtitle in eight different languages, and um, ticket prices tend to be around $20 in the US and around $30 sorry, whatever that is in Euro, um, in, in, um, in Europe. And um, I just want to give you a quick snapshot, because I'm not assuming everyone would have seen them, that just gives you a, a taste of the HD shows. This is Anna Netrebko in a newish role for her as Lady Macbeth in Verdi's Macbeth. And um, it's the scene when she is um, plotting to get her husband to do ter terrible things for power. Um, and you'll see also an interview clip. It's actually done pretty much after that big scene that she has live backstage, which is the thing that people seem to really gravitate to and respond to, because you see usually an American opera singer, um, but often others. We have Anita Rashvelashvili, the Georgian singer, um, doing the interview, talking to the artist right after a big scene, or you see set changes and other things. So there's a really um, sense of, of being there collectively watching with other people around the world. So this is just a clip from last fall. How, 
how you decided to get in this Tour de Force role? Um, because I'm crazy, naturally, and I want to always to try something. And, and also I thought uh, it will suit me, mm -hmm. uh, definitely my personality. And I didn't know about the voice, but uh, I find out. Okay. during these two years and so <laughs> you are i know you and you are a very nice person in a real I'm life so you nice. are yes. and you are and who is laughing there who is laughing there <laughs> but you seem to be really comfortable with this evil yeah. role how you manage that i do think what in every human being there is a always both sides so never believe those people who are always sweet they have this dark side so i can <laughs> can expose this on the stage where do you can expose that this is the question <laughs> Bravo. as you see um, the artists get to express themselves and connect to audiences and in real time they're getting you know tweets and posts from their friends watching around the world um, and it really kind of lifts the veil of formality that that has sometimes um, enveloped opera and maybe kept it less connected to audiences. And we try to produce it so that it's interesting to people who are seasoned opera goers, but also it's accessible for first timers. Um, and in the nine seasons now, we've done 89 shows and we've sold 18 million tickets around the world. And um, what happens with these shows is we kind of roll it out kind of like, well, somewhat like a movie, where you have the live uh, window, sometimes we do encores, and then it posts on Met Opera On Demand, uh, fixed 30 to 60 days later, and then we do show them on PBS, our American broadcast partner, and some of them end up on DVD. And um, our catalog for Met Opera On Demand, because I know that's one of the things we're going to be talking about, um, it's a yearly subscription of about $150, or a monthly, which is the most popular subscription, for $15 a month, or you, you can do pay-per-view. And 80% of our video traffic is for the online assets. And we're also in about 80 schools around the world, from the Sorbonne to the Royal College of Music to the Hong Kong um, University in Hong Kong, uh, for universities to have uh, access for all of their students to listen to and watch the content. And I would say that with the Met, it's very promotional and sensibility, but it's also the content itself to reach people with the immersive live live performance. Thank you very much, Elena. Now, next we have Christian, who as a representative of classic TV, is really one of the aggregators, and I would even venture to say perhaps curators mm -hmm. of classical music. Thank and you. I look forward to hearing his views. Yeah. My name is Christian Schaff. Um, I'm the founder and manager of Classic TV. Now, Classic TV is something, you mentioned Netflix. It, you could call it the German Netflix of classical music. We feature about 700 works at the moment, opera, um, symphonies, chamber music, uh, ballets. So we have the wider scope, not only as far as the genres are concerned, but also history. We try to do a canonical approach, curated approach from Baroque times to now. We have very modern operas also, um, some modern, very modern symph symphonic, symphonic music also, but try to like reach out to those who are classical music lovers and take them by the hand and guide them through the world of classical music. Because we know there's lots of people who love to get in touch with classical music, but say, and actually Tori Amos gave us this idea, she said, I have so many friends from my old uh, nightclub times, and they would like to listen to some classical music, but they're afraid because there's so much out there and they don't know. Um, so we're trying to grab everybody by the hand. We have short introductions into operas that are uncommon, not so complicated, like the ones that you read in your um, uh, um, playbill usually, where almost a new role is introduced with every new sentence. We try to cut that down, strip it down to the essential. Uh, we also have guides to um, symphonic uh, oeuvres, for instance, also for people who are interested to compare. We have uh, all Beethoven symphonies from different conductors, different orchestras. We have all Bruckner symphonies from different orchestras. Uh, we have uh, Mahler, of course. We have Schubert, Schumann. Um, and then, of course, we start with Bach, uh, all Brandenburg concertos with um, Karl Richter, the famous ones, the old ones. And we also believe in, in like old oeuvres. There has been a lot of excellent recordings also in the symphonic world, dating back maybe as early as the 60s, but uh, they still, we still cherish them and think they're among the best that you can see. So in that sense, we're also uh, a Netflix and we conserve the old values. Um, our subscription models are comparable. We have a monthly, three-month and yearly subscription. 
We also have a pay-per-view, but I must say also our, our uh, subscription is far more successful than, um, than the pay-per-view. And we have, a, we reach, we are strictly German, the whole uh, page is in German, some say that, it's a, that is a mistake, <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we saw that niche. We have about uh, 30,000 uh, viewers uh, or unique uh, people coming to us every month and about something between 90 and 120,000 page impressions per month. Okay, thank you, Christian. And now moving on to Robert from the Berlin Philharmonic. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Robert Zimmerman and I'm managing the Berlin Film Media, which is a subsidiary of the foundation Berliner Philharmonica. We founded the company in 2008 to take over responsibility for all the new media and I would say multimedia and social communication activities of the orchestra. And maybe instead of telling you what we do, I would like to tell you why we do it, because I think that is the starting point or the more important starting point of all the discussions which we have. And I also saw the session before. Um, you know, when you are, are as an orchestra in 2008, when you suddenly start to realize, especially as Berlin Phil, with such a media tradition and such a strong media presence, when you suddenly realize that the TV slots are getting less and less and the CD sales are getting less and less and you want to preserve and maintain your visibility and the access to your audience and you want to kind of um, yeah, be more visible or remain visible. And you see that there is an industry in front of you with production companies, labels, TV stations and, and the internet giants and you don't really know what to do. And we spent a lot of time and effort in finding a strategy how we deal with the situation. And um, you must also imagine an orchestra which plays in halls all over the world and suddenly realizes that uh, in addition to the 2,000 people within the hall, there are 20,000 people sitting outside watching the concert on a single screen in a bad resolution and screaming afterwards when the orchestra is coming outside. Um, the musicians felt that there is potential and there is a need and there's a demand to change something. And that was the time when we invented sort of the digital concert hall and said, we want to transmit our complete artistic work of the orchestra to the whole world and to everybody who wants to see it. In this case, wants to buy it and be part of the orchestra and participate in our um, creative work. And um, this turned out to be a wonderful project and it turned out to be a core of many other activities, also our social media activities and also the activities which we do with our label now. But, you know, the essence of this is get to know your audience and get your audience engaged and get our audience engaged, get to know them. In 2008, I think we had an email, uh, we had an email stock of... 8,000 email addresses and these email addresses weren't used by the way there was not a used newsletter which was sent to everybody today we are talking to uh, we are talking to hundred thousands of people by email and we're talking to millions of people through the social media channels uh, and it is a completely different kind of interaction and engagement between the musicians of the orchestra and the fan base which we serve on a worldwide basis and that in the end is the real value of what has been created not that we earn money by uh, distributing videos it is this engagement this closeness to our fan base and the closeness to the people who want to see it uh, and we are slowly reaching a point where even this endeavor is becoming uh, profitable so that participating people even earn money. Maybe just for a start so far and more at the discussion. Thank you, Robert and Sir Simon. <laughs> okay, we've got a, a few minutes to discuss a few things uh, among the panel members and, and clearly there's a, a wide myriad of questions that we could explore, but Elena, you were talking about this balance between the experienced opera lover, the knowledgeable customer, and trying to win newcomers. How do you balance this with the content that you make available? You know, the radio team that I work with at the Met, they went to for a field trip to ESPN, which is the big sports uh, broadcaster, in, uh, hugely successful in the United States, and they, they said that they steer their content toward a seven, 10 being the most knowledgeable. And we played around with that idea in our um, radio and HD meetings. Um, 
in that we want to talk about classical music in a way that's um, embracing of people so that you don't feel like if you don't know these things already that you, you should have known that before this art form isn't for you, but also to offer things that would otherwise not be available um, to a viewer because you don't get to wander around backstage and you don't get to see the craft of, of opera. So I think we try to balance um, the content uh, video and audio so that it's both um, revealing and insightful and it definitely has a, um, a yen toward being more live, partly for budgetary reasons because it costs more to do you know, pre-produced, heavily edited pieces. Um, and we keep the viewer in mind, but hopefully, I mean, we have a lot of people who see it in the Opera House and then they actually go and see it in HD. And we have people who see it as a subscription like around the world uh, because it's the Met and because of the repertoire and the artists that we're able to do. So we do try to balance that all the time. And sometimes maybe we're a little American entertaining, but hopefully it's always in interesting to the global audience. It should be entertaining. Well, yes. Okay, and, and Christian, in this, this ecosystem of streaming, has we have the Netflix, have we, we have the YouTubes, the Spotify's, do you think that a certain inexperienced classical music person or someone who is unsure about classical music is going to use those more mass market channels and then come to you as a specialist for more specialist repertoire, for more curator activities? Well, I mean, everybody who's been on YouTube um, has probably also some experience what that feels like. I mean, I also. I, we don't curse YouTube. <laughs> I also occasionally watch that stuff on YouTube, but the, the experience is that most of, most of the time you just get ex excerpts, and um, uh, sometimes also in really bad quality, sometimes in very good quality, amazingly, but uh, it, there's no consistent quality, right? And if you want to see whole works or read a little to it or compare, then you have to be taken by the hand. Either you're an expert already, I guess that uh, there's lots of experts here who don't need a curator, but there's lots of people out there who need um, extra documentation, background information about the pieces. And of course, um, at, on Classic TV, you can see whole works in consistent quality from beginning to end. Plus, you can, of course, interrupt whenever you want, which is uh, also an advantage sometimes. Tristan, four hours, 15. <laughs> a long piece, and we also feature that, of course. Um, but I would say that, that the advantage uh, over uh, YouTube is that we collect and gather, plus also, that's also an important feature I, I forgot to mention before, we not only have an archive, we also reach out to the artists who are out there. We also, not only an aggregator for a big archive, we also want to be an, uh, an aggregator for the new artists, the upcoming artists who are out there. We offer interviews, we have a big interview section already. We also have, by the way, a whole page about the Classical Next with five interviews from yesterday. Um, and we also try to reach out to new endeavors in classical music like uh, uh, prices. We, for instance, feature also live streams of piano prices. We did a live stream with the Hamburg Symphonics last week um, and so forth. That means it's not only history that we feature. We also go into the future and actually want to reach out to those new players who are on the market who want to co cooperate with us. And we offer also our branches into the, into the media world because we cooperate with Spiegel Online, uh, who we deliver uh, video embeds for. We cooperate with different platforms like Rondo, Crescendo, Concerti, uh, and so forth, um, and try to get those journalists interested because, coming back to YouTube, the big slogan, broadcast yourself, is only partially true. For some people it works, like Valentina Lisica, who we also interviewed, she is like the big YouTube star in classical music, but I think she's the only one. And all the others who broadcast it themselves have uh, 384 clicks after three years. And we cannot cure that problem totally, but we can promise that if you work together with us, you have more than 384 clicks after three years. Okay, and Robert, speaking of 384 clips, I know that yesterday in our conversation, you made some very interesting suggestions as to how let's say a smaller regional ensemble or an individual artist could utilize online and digital communication with audiences, if not for revenue, at least to, to capture value. What are your suggestions for someone like that? Well, um, as I said at the beginning, I think the core asset of any online and, and streaming activity is um, to, to get the address and the email and the name of the person who is actually interested in you. 
And I strongly believe that the technological path we are on is getting so much easier and cheaper in future that uh, basically every ensemble and every artist uh, will be in a position in three, four, five years' time to finance uh, recording and streaming, not easily, but it is doable. And I think on the end consumer devices, the worlds between streaming, television, downloading, having your content will be facilitated so much by algorithms, by search engines, by whatever you can think on a television or on your iPhone or your iPad, that the consumer in the end will not really know where he gets things from, where he gets content from. He's just looking for something or something is presented to him and he will use it. And these worlds will merge and that is of great advantage to anybody who wants to participate. Uh, and I th strongly think that the development we are seeing with the, with the big companies, be it Apple, be it Samsung or Sony, they're making things so easy, which at the moment seems so complicated to place your content somewhere and to make it accessible, make it visible, make it, make it findable. Uh, this will be a lot easier in five years' times because then you will basically just talk to your television set and say, well, I want to see Brahms too full stop and then it will suggest to you things and if you know who you want to see it off it's even easier and it will search every corner of the internet and will search by big data or whatever you call it every inch of what's available and it will present it to you and the key to success is to be there you know to play with these guys to make it available to record it and find a way um, to, to bring it onto those devices. And I think to expand upon that, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Chris Anderson's The Long Tail, a very interesting book about digital marketing and digital content, and how in an online world, um, it's, it's really infinite, that the, the tail of what can be available to consumers can be infinite, and that taking a lot of the small niche markets, of which many aspects of classical music is, can add up to a significant business when you reach a global audience. And I, I think that one of the allusions that Chris Anderson made in the book was on the lines of what Robert was saying, make everything available and help me find it. And I think that's, that's some advice that we can all take with us, regardless of the size of our business or the, the knownness of our organization or of our artist. So. But Maybe, maybe we just, I mean, to, to make it a bit more practical for you to understand, when we started this endeavor, it was a purely, it was a computer thing, you know, streaming was a computer, and the computer most of the time was in your, in, in your working space. What a ridiculous situation to stream visible classical music onto your, onto your working desk at home or at work, and that's only six years ago. Today, at the time, nobody thought you could watch HD video on here. Nobody dreamt of having a TV set which is internet connected. That's, uh, nobody even thought about YouTube being the biggest phenomenon and Facebook. That's only six years ago. And if you think five years in advance, I promise you, uh, it will again change so dramatically that everything, everything will be on your TV and even more will be on this and you will have it everywhere. So the trick is just make it, produce it as cheap as possible, and put it out there. Okay. And on that note, I'd actually like to open things up to you. If there's specific questions that you might have for any of the panel members. It's a question for Elena and for Robert specifically. I mean, you, what you do uh, extraordinarily brings your work within reach of people who couldn't experience it live. But I wonder what research you've both done about whether there's any impact on the number of people who are paying to experience work live. Your ticket buyers, is it going up, is it going down? Is there any connection between that and the streaming services? Rob, well, Robert has more data than I do, sadly. <laughs> um, we, um, there have been some studies in the United States that talked about um, 
uh, attendance of the HD shows correlating to more attendance of live opera in people's local communities, which is um, encouraging. Um, and I think that it's it's contributed, we hear an more anecdotally, to people going in their own places to more live events because we always try to encourage the fa people to go because it shouldn't be at all a replacement. It should just be a complement to going to a theater and having a communal experience in, a, in an opera house. Um, we, and sadly, we don't have as much data as we would like because we have moved movie theater partners, um, we typically get 50% of the revenue, but we go through chains who, that's their proprietary information. So we try to reach them through our own social media channels so we can talk to them directly. So half of our 330,000 Facebook um, fans are actually outside the US, which I think they're mostly HD people, so we try to talk to them. But I, I know Robert has actually very impressive data. Yeah, I have some more data which, which, which supports the argument that is in the contrary. We are attracting people, we are creating desire for people who live wherever to come to Berlin, uh, besides facilitating them to be there with us. Um, and you see, we have two websites, and we deliberately have two websites. We have the Berliner Philharmonica website, which is a, you know, it informs you, you can buy tickets, you can go to the hall, and we have the digital concert hall, which is a separate space, it's a location, it's a place to go to. And at the Berliner Philharmonica website, the traffic, I think, is 85% from Germany and Berlin, and the digital concert hall is exactly the opposite. We have more than 80% traffic from outside of Germany and only 2% of our turnover and customers in the digital concert hall is made with people around and in Berlin. Uh, and 80% is done outside of Europe, uh, outside of Germany, and 50% outside of Europe. So it is the digital concert hall is a, is a global international project and playing in Berlin is a, you know, it's still the local thing. By the, by the response we get from our customers, uh, they, you know, I get more emails saying, uh, well, I, now I really want to go and watch the Berlin Phil wherever they are, and they're incentivized to go there. I get far more emails saying that instead of, oh, well, I don't have to go to the Philharmonie anymore, now I can watch it in my living room. Um, so it, it is an outreach and it's an incentive to follow the orchestra and, and to come. Next question. So it's, uh, hello, it's a question for Christian. Uh, you say you are an aggregator of content, so how do you aggregate this content? Are you a co-producer of some of uh, the concerts, or just do you just buy programs? Well, it's a mix of things. Um, for the archive, most of it comes from the big uh, TV producers in the past and now, um, Unitel, uh, Opus Arte, and Arthouse. Um, but we also produce our own stuff. Um, of course, that's on a smaller scale. Um, that's um, chamber music. It's uh, the live streams that we produce, and it's the interviews that we produce. More, more or less, what Elna does for for the Met program, Classic TV does as an additional val added value for the content that we have in our archive, which is mostly um, not co-produced but bought. Okay. I just had a question for Robert. I'd love to know a little bit more about the financial model of the way you work and is, is the digital console uh, publicly subsidized or is it through corporate partnerships or does it pay its way through? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we started the digital console, it had to go uh, through the supervisory board of the foundation and the supervisory board is influenced or dominated by politicians. And uh, there was one single thing they said, not a penny of public money, full stop. Mm -hmm. This is entrepreneurial, new business, internet stuff we don't understand and we don't <laughs> want to run into any risk for our orchestra. Mm -hmm. So we never received a single penny public subsidy or funding. We were happy enough and lucky enough to have Deutsche Bank as a sponsor who saw the business plan and said, okay, we will finance the first three, in the end they financed the first five years, uh, of, of seed money which we needed um, and that was that was a lucky circumstance but I must say from from day one we pay about 40 percent of all revenue to artists publishers collecting societies orchestra uh, so a big chunk of what we do in turnover from the first day on always went to the artists other questions 
Hi, my name is Lucas. I have a quick question basically to all of you. First of all, um, how difficult is it for you to always get all the rights in order to stream? I mean, you have, a, you have an artist coming in, a soloist, and he has a contract with a major label. Uh, I, I suppose that is not always easy. And then the other question, um, is there still, are there still artists that are reluctant um, to put their music on a platform like yours? Um, knowing that basically their performance, their live performance is then fixed forever in eternity <laughs> and their little slip ups, their little mistakes can be seen um, forever by everyone. Uh, for the Met, um, it, the union agreements of the Met um, were left open, the media part, when um, Peter Gelb took over and he and the former general manager negotiated with the unions to have a, a much more forward-thinking media clause because the revenue was going down and the Met wasn't on TV and there wasn't as much opera in, in the media at all. So it, it became a more open agreement where the Met could use the footage and have access for news or promotional value um, for you know news coverage and things. And then on the on the Met side, we could exploit the content knowing that the, the artist would benefit at the back end, the artist, the stagehands, everyone else who was in the, in the, um, the world of making the show. So the profit sharing model actually bore fruit, I think, in the year three of the HD show. Um, in two, two years ago, we had $60 million of gross revenue, and the net revenue to the Met was um, $17 million to the Met. And, and that was after payments to the artists and the people who participated, so it ended up being a revenue source. And I think that um, the first season was a little rocky in terms of getting everyone on board for what this was because we had cameras backstage in the dressing rooms and the holy areas that nobody was allowed to go in. But quickly all the artists and the people participating wanted to be interviewed. Um, I remember one time Bryn Terrible, I ran into him before Ryan Gold and we weren't planning to talk to him because it's a new production, there was no intermission. And I ran into him and he said, all my friends are watching in Wales, why aren't you interviewing me? And I said, oh, great. So we added a segment and Debbie Voigt talked to him. So um, there are a lot of adjustments in terms of the, the rights, but it, after the first uh, season, it kind of cleared the way and everyone got very excited. Well, for Classic TV, it's pretty simple. Those things that ha ha that come from like TV sources, all the rights are cleared. If they're not cleared, we cannot buy it. <laughs> um, and uh, the only uh, things in question are, are GEMA and GVL in our um, um, realm. And for the new things, there we see the shift in, in the classical production altogether because um, in the earlier days, we had big artists who had a big reputation and uh, actually controlled everything in such a production, namely uh, Berlin Philharmonics and Karajan, for instance. And nowadays, people are new. The new and upcoming artists see as as a as a way of promotion and, and communication. And uh, I must say, there we didn't have a lot of such discussions. Actually, they wanted us to broadcast them. Well, with the Berlin Phil, it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated because we are producing. And uh, on the other hand, if 128 Berliner Philharmonica musicians say that they want it, it's quite a persuasive argument for every artist who comes to Berlin to participate. So that was a big advantage to have the orchestra who really is with his whole force and his whole conviction behind this project to say to the soloists and the conductors, please be one of us, be part of this project. And uh, we managed in, I would say, 98% of the cases to, to, to negotiate the rights for the digital concert hall together with the performance contract. Uh, and then again, you're right, I mean, the collecting societies and the publishers, uh, that, is a, that is a tough cookie to negotiate. And uh, I wouldn't, you know, yeah, that's, that's a problem. But even there, I think, over the next years, uh, there will be ways to make this easier to, to negotiate, hopefully. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming and participating, and thank you for some very interesting questions. I hopefully uh, have the support of the team, I'm sure I have the support of the team, that I'm sure you have many other very interesting and, and stimulating questions, and I think we'll all be around for a few moments. So we have to finish here because of time. Thank you for coming. If you have further questions, the panelists and myself will be available for a few moments now. Thank you for coming. <laughs>